All right, everybody, we're here with Mike talking about modernizing app.NET applications with .NET Core. Take it away, Mike. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, like we said, my name's Mike Russos. I'm a principal software engineer on the .NET customer engagement team. I've been at Microsoft 15 years working on .NET the whole time, and we're going to talk today about when you move a desktop application to .NET Core, beyond just making a new project file and targeting .NET Core, what other sorts of issues might you run into and how can you work past them? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and we're going to take a look at some slides. So let's see if we can get that working. All right. So, so uh, again, this is modernizing with .NET Core beyond the basics. Hey, Mike, do you want And to... it is the fourth in a series of talks uh, over the past few days which have looked at how you can take a WPF or WinForms desktop .NET application and bring it over to .NET Core so that it uh, runs in a more modern environment. Hey, Mike, we started with could Olia you close sharing that window for during... us up there? Oh, right sorry, what's side. that? Could you close that little window, that little Skype window on oh, the upper right-hand side? Oh, didn't even notice that thing. No yep. problem. It, it always happens. Thanks. Yep. Appreciate the pointer. Okay. So, yeah. So, Olia started us off during the keynote talking about uh, how you can use try convert to convert the project file and some basic steps there. And then she had a talk on day one to go in a little bit more depth. We've also had talks talking about DevOps and App Center and XAML tools in Visual Studio for WPF and UWP development. So what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of that next step. After you've done all of these things, what feature areas are different, what things might need changed, and how can you do that? So this talk is called Beyond the Basics. Here's the things that I consider the basics that I think have already been covered. Using the portability analyzer, updating NuGet references, updating project files, targeting .NET Core, using the Windows compatibility pack. So if you haven't seen this stuff, go check out Olia's talk. Familiarize yourself with that. And in many cases, after you've gone through these steps, a lot of uh, .NET applications will just work on .NET Core at that point. But for some, there's a number of features that work differently, and so there may be additional work needed depending on the specific application you're porting. So here are the things that we're going to talk about during this talk. We're going to talk about managed security, app domains, configuration, interop, and remoting. And that's a lot of topics. So I'm going to have to move fairly quickly. I've got a couple of demos, but I'm going to try to keep things moving along. And we'll just sort of look at this at a high level. And then I've got some demos out on GitHub that you guys can look at afterwards if you want to spend some more time. And I'm going to save a few minutes at the end, hopefully, although started a little late, so we'll see what happens. But we'll try to have some time for Q&A at the end of this talk if there's things you guys want to hear a little more detail about. So jumping in, I'm going to start with um, security because this one's actually really simple. And this, it's simple because the story is there is no managed security on .NET Core. We have the APIs for code access security. We have the APIs for transparency so that all of your existing attributes and calls to these systems will continue to compile and work if you've got a lot of these attributes in your code base. But the thing you need to know is that there are no ops now. Since about .NET 4 or so, we've been giving the message that code access security is not a security boundary because managed code is not the right place to implement a sandbox. There's too many ways to get around that. The right, the right way to sandbox your code and run it partially trusted is at the OS level. So you would do this with things like virtualization, containers, user accounts, maybe run as a UWP app with only certain app capabilities. Those are the right ways to restrict access that an application has. Doing that in managed code has always been a challenge, and it's never worked particularly well. So in .NET Core, we go the final step, and we say none of these APIs do anything. So in most cases, this doesn't require any changes in your application. You just need to understand that these attributes and calls no longer uh, have any effect. The one case where this will require a change in your code is if you're using any APIs which restrict permissions. If you call permission set dot deny or permit only, these would have worked previously, but now in .NET Core they throw a platform not supported exception, so that developers are really clear that they are not uh, restricting permissions because in .NET Core all code runs as fully trusted and security critical. Now there are some APIs which relate to ACLs. And these still work as expected because that's not related to managed security. This is about access control at the OS level. 
So these APIs, which you'll find in the Compat pack, still work the same as you'd expect, but anything CAS related, aptca, transparency, that stuff uh, no longer no longer works in .NET Core. So that's that's item number one. And if you look on GitHub uh, with the link I show at the end of this talk, I do have a, a quick sample, but I'm not going to show the code for this one because it's just showing that you can call from code labeled transparent into code labeled critical and .NET Core and everything works as expected. So uh, we're going to move along. So I've got some more interesting demos I want to save some time for. Okay. So secondly, and this is one of those more interesting demos, app domains. So in .NET Core, many of the app domain APIs are still present. You're still able to... Uh, register an unhandled exception handler, you're able to inspect the app domain, things like that work. But the important difference in .NET Core compared to .NET Framework is that there's only one default app domain and no other app domains can be created. So if your application that you're porting was previously spinning up uh, secondary app domains, that's going to fail now. And you're going to have to change your app to accommodate the fact that there's only one app domain in a .NET Core process. Now, the way you do this kind of depends on why you were using multiple app domains. In some cases, customers uh, use in their .NET Framework applications were spinning up additional app domains so that they could run some code in partial trust, so they could have some sort of sandboxed app domain. Now, I just mentioned on the last slide, sandboxing's gone, so that scenario no longer applies. If you were using app domains as a way to set up partial trust, uh, a partial trust environment for running code, that's not going to work. You need to run that code in the primary app domain, understanding that it's going to run with full trust, and that has to be all right. If that's not okay, you're going to have to consider running out of process or some other mechanism for sandboxing because app domains don't do that. Okay, so that's the first scenario. Second scenario, let's suppose you were using app domains as a way to isolate assemblies and unload them. Sometimes you see this with like a plugin architecture. Uh, you might have different plugins for your application, some of which might use different versions of the same assembly. So you want to load those assemblies in an isolated way so that one plugin can use version one, one plugin can use version two, and maybe when you're done with a plugin, you want to unload them because assemblies don't unload by themselves, but an app domain can be unloaded with all of the assemblies in it. So for this scenario, um, we added an API in .NET Core called Assembly Load Context. Now the idea of a load context where the assembly or where the loader loads an assembly is not new in .NET Core, but this API is new. And in .NET Core 3, what's new is that they can be unloaded. So this is a mechanism where you can have different logical containers in your application that load assemblies in isolation. So you might have different versions of the same assembly loaded into multiple assembly load contexts, and they'll each work. And then when you're done with them, if you want, you can unload an assembly load context, and all of the assemblies that were there get unloaded with it. So I'm going to hop over into Visual Studio, and we're going to do a quick demo of what it looks like to use assembly load context in place of app domains for assembly unloading. So in here, in this solution, I've got a little folder for each of the topics I'm talking about, and this will be shared on GitHub. But for the app domains part, I've got a simple main method that just demonstrates that some app domain uh, properties are readable on .NET Core. And then I call this helper called assembly loader that use assembly and unload. And it's going to load up this type, MBRO type, which is going to call into a helper library called mathlib to calculate some Fibonacci numbers. It's not very complicated. The important thing is we're going to do this in a secondary app domain and then unload it so that the math library never gets loaded into our primary app domain. Now you can see that I've got some pound ifs here. Uh, so that we have this code working differently when it builds against .NET Framework compared to when it get, runs against .NET Core. So these uh, defines, Net 472, Net Core app, are automatically defined depending on the framework that you're targeting. So if you have a project file like this one, and let me take open it up so we can take a look, that's using multi-targeting, you can see how I'm actually targeting two different frameworks. I'm targeting both .NET 472 and .NET Core app 3.0. Or if you have two separate project files, one which targets .NET Framework, one which targets .NET Core, if you end up in a situation where some code paths need to do one thing for .NET Framework and one thing for .NET Core, an easy way to do that at build time is to use these built-in defines to differentiate between the two. In this case, the only difference is that I want to display for demo purposes where we're running. 
So I show either the current domain's name if we're running on .NET Framework, or even though this API still exists in .NET Core, it wouldn't be interesting because it wouldn't change. Instead on .NET Core, I can switch over here which, um, which target I'm looking at. You can see when we're targeting .NET Core, this one lights up. Instead, we're going to be looking at the current assembly load context's name. Okay, So the way we're doing this is with this helper type I talked about, assembly loader. And here I use another trick for targeting both .NET Framework and .NET Core at the same time because this code's going to be fairly different. I have one implementation, which I'm going to use on .NET Framework, which uses app domains to load an assembly and unload it. I have a different implementation of the same class, which does the same thing using assembly load contexts for .NET Core. So we saw that you can say pound if net 472 or pound if uh, net core app for, for small pieces of code in your project. If you have whole classes that need to be implemented differently for .NET Framework and .NET Core and you want to build against both of those targets, uh, a pattern that I've worked with customers in the past to use and that's, that's been helpful is to just have conditional item groups where you say, if we're targeting net 472 or whatever .NET Framework version you're targeting, you can even say if it begins with net, you know, something, then we remove from compiling any source files with the net core CS suffix. Um, and likewise, if we're targeting .NET Core, we, re we remove anything with the net effects suffix. So this way I have two different assembly files, one for .NET Framework, one for .NET Core, and they'll be built one for Framework, one for Core, depending on what we're targeting. I also have a none include here. This is a little trick. Um, this it ensures that the, the source files show up in the Solution Explorer even if we're not building them. Because by default, this will only show the files for whichever target framework is first here. So by doing a none include on this, this makes sure that we build only when we're targeting the correct framework, but we still see both files in our Solution Explorer. Okay, so that's not anything to do with app domains, but some tidbits on working with different code paths as you take your application and start to have to bifurcate it between running on .NET Framework or .NET Core. Coming back to the app domain sample itself, what my assembly loader is going to do in the .NET Framework case is very simple. We create an app domain. Um, we create and unwrap an instance of that type that I was talking about. And then we uh, just have some logging to demonstrate um, that the math library hasn't been loaded in either domain. We call this helper method on that type that will run in the secondary app domain to calculate some Fibonacci numbers. And then we uh, have some more logging to demonstrate that the math library has been loaded into the secondary domain, not into the primary one. Then we call appdomain.unload to unload everything from that domain, and we're done. If we do this for .NET Core, it looks a little bit different. For .NET Core, instead, I'm going to create an assembly load context. Now here I've actually derived from assembly load context, and I'll show you why I do that. Beginning with .NET Core 3, you can use assembly load context directly. It's a concrete type. Uh, but by, over, by overriding it, by deriving from it, I have the opportunity to override the load method, which is useful because this is the method that the assembly load context uses when it needs to load an assembly implicitly. So I'm going to load, if we come back here and look at the assembly loader code, I'm going to explicitly load this demo assembly in the secondary load context because that's where the MBRO type lives. Once we've done that, though, this type is going to need to use that math library. And so that's going to be implicitly loaded into the assembly load context. And the way that will be done is controlled by the load method. So in here, we're just using the normal resolve uh, behaviors to go and resolve it from our um, project assets JSON file the same way it would with the default load context. But uh, this can all be customized. So you can customize how you probe for assemblies, how you load them, and so on in your own assembly load contexts. The interesting thing, though, is that we will get that type via reflection from the assembly that's loaded in the other load context. So even though this type is going to have the same name as the type that's in this load context, they're going to be treated as different types. But via reflection, we can invoke an API on it. So we're going to call this call helper API, and it's going to go off. It's going to uh, invoke the math library, do some Fibonacci sequencing, and it's going to come back with a number. All fairly straightforward. We've got the same sort of logging as before, where we demonstrate that the math library is only loaded in the secondary context. And then we call load context.unload. Now, in this case, it's a little bit different. I'm going to return a weak reference to this load context so that I can then do a GC collect and watch for this load context to be cleaned up. 
And the reason I do this is that there's an important difference between unloading an app domain and unloading an assembly load context. When you unload an app domain, it's a rude unload. Any code that's executing the app domain is aborted. Everything's just torn down immediately and unloaded. When you unload an assembly load context, it's a cooperative unload. So this call here, where I say load context.unload, requests that the load context and any assemblies in it are cleaned up. But that won't actually happen until there's no more references to the load context. So that means there can't be any stack frames referencing assemblies from this load context on any of my threads call stacks. It means we can't have any references to types from uh, assemblies in this load context. So if you're migrating an application that previously unloaded app domains and you're now unloading a load context, you need to be aware of this difference so you can make sure that you're cooperating with the load context and not having any references hanging around. So in this case, we do the collect and we, we wait to make sure that in fact that weak reference is no longer alive, which is the indication that the load context has been unloaded, cleaned up, and those assembly references are gone. So let's go ahead and run this. I'll do it over here so that we've got a nice big font that you guys can see. If I do a .NET run dash F net 472, remember I'm targeting both .NET Framework and .NET Core, so I use the dash F parameter on .NET run to specify which one of these multi-targeted frameworks I'm using. So running against .NET Framework, it says creating app domain. Uh, we see that the math library is not loaded anywhere, but then we run this Fibonacci uh, helper in the new domain, you see, and now the math library is loaded in that new domain. It's still not loaded in the current domain. We unload the app domain. So at this point, the math library is not loaded anywhere, and we're done. You can do something very similar if we do a .NET run dash F net core app 3.0. And so now we're going to, it's going to look very similar, but you'll want to notice that instead of talking about app domains, now we've created a new load context. And that's the context that this code is running in. I passed in a different input value for variety. But here you see that the math library is loaded in the new context. It is not in the default context. And again, we unload. Prior to the unload, here's the list of our assembly load contexts. After the unload, here's the list because the second one's gone along with the libraries that were in it like math library. All right, went through that quick, but the code will be up on GitHub and we can take questions at the end. So that's a quick overview of app domains in .NET Core. You only get one assembly load context for everything else. Next up, configuration. So this is an interesting one. It's, it's a pretty simple story, but I want to make sure to call it out because it comes up a lot. And the story is this. App.config and Configuration Manager and those sorts of APIs, they're all still present in .NET Core. They're in the compat pack just like so many other things. So you can still use app settings, connection strings, custom config sections that maybe you take advantage of in your .NET Framework app. However, the Framework APIs themselves do not use app.config, and they don't respect any sections in there other than just app settings or connection strings. So previously with .NET Framework, there were a lot of APIs which had their own config sections that you could use to configure them. Things like WCF clients could be configured that way, system diagnostics tracing, system.net, a number of others. All of these config sections were defined in the global machine.config file. In .NET Core, there is no machine.config, so even having one of these sections in your config file will prevent it from loading on .NET Core. You need to remove them. Um, and even if you were to define these custom sections yourself, well, then the config file would load, but .NET still doesn't use them. Uh, so you may as well get rid of them. Instead, you need to uh, configure these .NET APIs programmatically. Okay, so if you were previously setting up trace sources and listeners and switches in config, now you do it in code. You still can get information from the config file, either from app settings or from a more modern Microsoft extensions configuration config file, like an app settings.json or from environment variables. But that's going to require uh, still using the APIs to configure tracing, WCF clients, whatever, and just pulling key values out of config. One place where this comes up a lot is with WCF. So .NET Core supports WCF client APIs, so you can call WCF services. But if you previously generated your WCF client with the service util tool, it will have created an app.config file where it sets up that WCF client. That's not going to work anymore. So the recommendation when you're using WCF clients with .NET Core is to remove any auto-generated code and regenerate it with new tools that will generate the same uh, functionality in a .NET standard or a .NET Core compliant way. So we've got two options for this. 
there's .NET Service Util, which is a .NET CLI tool that can be used uh, from the command line, or from Visual Studio. In the Visual Studio Connected Services menu, you can add a WCF service, and in that way, you'll get a uh, WCF client generated that's .NET standard and .NET Core compatible, doesn't depend on config files at all. Okay. Now, that's WCF client. You're probably also wondering about WCF server APIs, because I do get asked about those a lot when I'm working with customers. Um, and there was a blog post recently by Scott Hunter you can go check out. And basically, at this point, .NET Core is feature complete. We're not planning to add support for WCF server APIs. So you'll want to look at alternatives like gRPC, which was demoed at the keynote, or possibly ASP.NET Core. If you really must stick with WCF, there's a couple options. One is that there's a community-driven effort called Core WCF, which is working to migrate at least some parts of WCF server APIs to work on .NET Core. So you may want to go check out that community effort, maybe contribute there. Or remember, .NET Framework isn't going away. It's not as new and as exciting as .NET Core, but we're continuing to support .NET Framework indefinitely. So if you have WCF server dependencies that you really can't get away from, it's fine to stay on .NET Framework until you get to a point where you're able to either use Core WCF because it's matured enough, or where you're able to move over to something like gRPC. So let's take a quick look at a config demo. So I'll hop back over here. And actually, um, just given the time, I might not run this one because it's not exciting to see run. But the thing I'm going to show you is just if you look at these two config files, I've got one for .NET Core and one for .NET Framework. And the thing that you'll notice is that they have a lot in common. They both have a custom config section, which is able to be used. Um, they both have app settings, which work the same. But in .NET Framework, I was configuring uh, tracing in configuration. This isn't going to work on .NET Core. Now, I did add a custom system diagnostic section. So if I wanted, I could uncomment this, and it won't actually fail. But it won't have any effect. So I may as well just remove it. Instead, what we need to do, if I come over and look at program.cs for this, for this demo, you can see that most of this code is going to run exactly the same on .NET Framework as it is on .NET Core. You've got um, app settings working. You've got custom configuration sections working. But after I create my trace source, on .NET Framework, this would have already been configured in by the app.config. Since that doesn't happen on .NET Core, I just have one extra call. I say configure trace source, and I'm adding my listeners and switches when we're targeting .NET Core uh, since that's not happening in the config file. That's the only difference, and it's going to be equivalent if you're using something like WCF clients, things like that. You do it in code, not in config. All right. Interop. So there's a number of different APIs you can use for interoperating between managed code and native code. And most of them work more or less on .NET Core. All that said, the recommended API here is going to be to p-invoke. When possible, you want to p-invoke because that's the only interop option that works cross-platform. If you have p-invokes, you can p-invoke on Windows, on Linux, or OS X, and it all works. Um, p-invokes have been in .NET Core since v1. They're battle-tested, and they're, you know, for new development, they're kind of the way we recommend. Now, that said, you still can use other options like COM and C++ CLI, but those are going to be Windows only because they've got a number of um, dependencies on the Windows operating system. COM in particular is ready with .NET Core 3. So if you have COM dependencies, you can use them on .NET Core the same as you could on .NET Framework with only just a few tweaks, uh, one of which is that dynamic type support isn't yet ready. That's on the roadmap. But by and large, COM works. And it's fine as long as you're only targeting Windows. Similarly, C++ CLI support is coming for .NET Core. There's a preview of it. If you download the Visual Studio 2019 16.4 preview, you'll get a new cl.exe, which has this slash CLR net core parameter so that you can build a C++ CLI assembly targeting .NET Core instead of targeting .NET Framework. So if you want, you can go play around with that today in preview. The experience is still a little bit rough because it's not integrated with the build system yet. So you're building everything from the command line with um, you know, cl.exe and link. Coming in a future 16.4 preview, we're going to integrate that with Visual Studio, with MS Build, with the project system. So it's going to feel very similar to working with C++ CLI on .NET Framework. You'll just select .NET Core as the target instead, and everything's going to work. So p invokes are recommended, comms available now, C++ CLI will be available with VS 2019 16.4 and .NET Core 3.1. It's in preview at the moment. Um, 
WinRT interop works same as always. Uh, system enterprise services APIs, though, are not supported. So if you use any of those, you're going to have to use an alternative interop mechanism. So uh, briefly, let's go ahead and take a look at what some of that looks like in code. If I come back over here, I will show you my interop demo. Uh, so for this one, it's it's fairly simple. I've got this program that's yes that that communicates with native code in three different ways. First, we call a C++ CLI um, API. So I'm calling IJW class .greet, and this is a method from a from an IJW assembly that I'm building, and I'll show you that in a minute. Then I have a com reference. If we take a look at our project file, you can see there's a com reference here. Now, com references work for .NET Core on Windows just like they did uh, in .NET Framework. So this continues to work for me to open up Excel and you know, interoperate with Excel. But com reference is only supported on Windows. So if you have any com references in your project file, you can't build them with .NET Build since that's a cross-platform tool. You have to use MS Build. But as long as you're only building on Windows, you can use MS Build on Windows and it will build com references. They work as before. Uh, similarly, if we want to do a more dynamic approach to com, we can use activator.create instance with a type from prog ID to maybe uh, get a reference to Internet Explorer and use com to open up Internet Explorer and navigate to a page. Here's where I was saying with .NET Framework, a lot of times people would use like a dynamic type here and call visible navigate. This support isn't ready yet. It's on the roadmap, um, though we don't have a, a definite timeline yet. So for the time being on .NET Core, you're going to call that sort of thing, these sorts of APIs via reflection. Um, the com reference one works uh, just exactly the same, though. Now, this C++ CLI class, it's very basic. All it's doing is writing to the console with managed code and native code. Um, the thing that's interesting to look at, if you check out the sample later, is that because we haven't integrated C++ CLI support with the build system yet, I'm using the 16.4 CL.exe preview to build this. So I'm building this particular library with the batch script at the moment. It's very low tech. But what you'll notice is that I've got one for building it for .NET Framework and another one for building it with .NET Core. The .NET Core one's almost the same with just a couple differences. You specify slash CLR net core instead of slash CLR. You have to reference the uh, reference assemblies you're using, like system.console for my console.writeline call. And when we link, you have to be sure to include the ijwhost.lib library to link against because that's where we have information about how to start up a .NET Core IJW um, instance. So other than those few changes, the process is exactly the same as building a C++ CLI assembly for .NET Framework, but now it'll target .NET Core. Now, for simple C++ CLI dependencies, you actually don't have to do this because remember, I think Olya talked about it, you can reference a .NET Framework assembly from a .NET Core project. It's not recommended because if the .NET Framework Assembly goes down some code path that uses an API that's not present on .NET Core, you're going to run into a, a runtime exception. But if for some reason you're not able to get a .NET Core or .NET Standard targeted version of an assembly, either because the NuGet package is old and not maintained, or it's a C++ CLI thing that you don't have the code for or something, or you don't want to use the preview tools, you can still reference the .NET Framework Assemblies. And as long as they don't use any APIs not available to .NET Core, they'll continue to work. It just adds a test burden since you have to make sure that everything works correctly at runtime. So very briefly, I will hop over into my interop folder. And although, you know what? Using .NET build and stuff isn't going to work because of my com reference. So instead, I'm just going to run this one from Visual Studio. When you multi-target, so again, I've got targets for both .NET Framework and .NET Core in one project file here. In the start debugging or launch dropdown, there's now a... Um, framework piece where you can choose which one of those we target. So first I'm going to run it against .NET Framework. And you will see here that it says hello from an IJW assembly. CLR version is 4.0. We start up Excel, start up Internet Explorer. Bet you didn't think you were going to see an Internet, Internet Explorer demo today, but uh, there you have it. And, and that works. Similarly, we can switch this over to .NET Core and it's going to look exactly the same. Difference being that now we're using the .NET Core version of the C++ CLI library, and we've had, got some very small code tweaks in how we are launching IE since we're not using the dynamic keyword anymore. But it all still works on .NET Core, uh, same as on .NET Framework. All right. So um, finally, remoting. 
Now, I say remoting intentional or otherwise because something I've noticed working with customers is that there's a number of cases where people are using remoting APIs when they're not even doing any remoting. One of those that comes up a lot is the real proxy type. Real proxy allows you to wrap an object uh, in a proxy that intercepts calls going to that type. And so people use it for an aspect-oriented programming design where they'll take cross-cutting concerns like logging or caching and add them to objects by wrapping objects in a proxy instead of updating the, the object types themselves. And this doesn't work on .NET Core because real proxy uses remoting and it's in the remoting namespace. But in order to make this scenario possible, we've added a new type in .NET Core called System Reflection Dispatch Proxy, which doesn't enable any remoting, but it allows that same wrapping of an API so that you can intercept calls to it. There's also Castle.Dynamic Proxy, which is a, you know, a third-party option that's very similar. So between Dispatch Proxy and Dynamic Proxy, you can replace your real proxy usage. Another place we see remoting come up inadvertently sometimes is if you're using um dot begin invoke or dot end invoke on a delegate under the covers that sort of asynchronous programming model does use remoting in its implementations so you can't do that on .NET core instead you should use task based asynchronous patterns use task.run things like that i've got a blog post on this one if you want more details i'm actually working on a blog post on proxies so if you watch the .NET team blog we should have something there soon about proxies as well if you're actually doing remoting this is where it's going to affect you more that .NET Core doesn't support remoting. So you've got a number of APIs for simple inter-process communication on the machine, and for more complex scenarios across machine remoting, again, there's gRPC, uh, ASP.NET Core. If you just want to do it yourself, you can use the Sockets APIs. And again, I'd refer you back to the keynote where we had some really cool gRPC demos because that's a technology that's going to become more and more important going forward with .NET Core, and it's worth checking those out to see how that works. I have a demo I'm not going to do. I've got a demo of replacing real proxy usage with dispatch proxy, but our time is up, so I'm just going to go on to here. Here's the link out to GitHub where you can get the demo code I was showing you if you want to look at it in more detail. And I'll let the hosts tell me if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'm happy, happy to, to take, take any questions folks have at this point. Unfortunately, we do not have time for questions. You want to turn your camera on for a second for us, Mike? Sure thing. Thank let's, you. Let's do that. All right. And you want to minimize your Skype window because like we're getting this Skype inception. The old uh, <laughs> there we go. recursive thing there. No, All right. It was a really I great presentation. Everybody was funny because we on, on the chat was we're talking about uh, P invoke and all the low level libraries. So everybody was, you know, you know, not reminiscing, but you know, that's how that <laughs> started, right? We did a lot of that because yeah. of all the com, com plus and uh, and visual basics. So no, it's great. Yeah. Ton of great content. Thank you for referencing all the other content that we presented earlier in the conference. And uh, awesome. thank you for you for taking the time. Everybody, uh, uh, everybody enjoyed it. All right. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thanks, we uh, are going to be getting um, our next speaker up and going yeah. here. So we'll Hamida make a next. We'll, yeah, Ramita? Hamida. Hamida. So Hamida is up next. We're going to make the slide changes here and we'll be right back. See you guys soon.